This episode of the Framework Podcast is brought to you by the City of Detroit's Planning and Development Department. Hey everyone, welcome to the Framework Podcast. This is your friendly neighborhood city planner, Rashid Al-Hassan Deepa. Our guest today is Rushan Long. Ms. Long was born and raised in Detroit and has been a resident of her community for over 60 years. She graduated from Charles C. Chatsi High School and attended local community colleges, graduating cum laude with a BS in Business Administration from William Tyndale College. Shortly thereafter, she became employed by General Motors Fisher Body Division for a short period of time before being hired by the State of Michigan Department of Human Resources, where she was employed for 36 years. Once she retired, she became active in her community when she saw how much blight was negatively impacting a once vibrant neighborhood and the quality of life for its residents. She joined the Midwest Civic Council of Block Clubs Association in 2012 to help address the blight. Once involved, she, along with several community residents, began to work on other issues facing the residents. Through her active role in the community, she became a member on a number of block clubs and formed several nonprofits. These include, but are not limited to, Greenway Heritage Conservancy, Greenway Grocery, Westside Coalition, and Pine Lawn LLC. She is also a board member of the organization Cut the Crap LLC. If you have been a long-time listener of the Framework Podcast, I'm sure you have heard the name Rushan Long come up every now and then. Unlike our previous episodes, the length of this one is a bit on the longer side. We felt it was important to capture her thoughts and aspirations for the community since she has been so actively involved in the Midwest Harman area. On a personal level, it has been a joy and pleasure to have a discussion with Miss Long and hear her thoughts about the Midwest Harman community. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Here's me talking to Miss Rushan Long. I, do you feel settled? You feel good? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. All right. Well, Miss Long. Thank you for taking your time from your busy schedule and joining us in this episode of the Framework Podcast. One of the first questions that I ask my guest is, how long have you been a resident in the neighborhood? Well, I've been in this neighborhood since 1962. I was nine years old and I'm 70 now. So that's 61 years. Mm -hmm. And um, happy belated birthday, just that Thank because you. you just let us know that you just had your birthday. So I don't know if you recall this, but um, when we had the first steering committee meeting at the St. Cyprian's Episcopal Church, we were all just hanging out at the sanctuary after the meeting and just having a casual conversation. And in that discussion, you said something that really stuck with me. You said, and I'm paraphrasing, I do not believe in ghosts, but every time I drive through this neighborhood, I see ghosts of buildings and things that were here. Provided yeah. I'm not misrepresenting your sentiment, can you elaborate no, on what you meant by that? Well, when you when since since I was here ever since a child, this was a much more vibrant community, a much more vi vibrant city, mm -hmm. and all of these um, neighborhoods had like a, their own business corridor. And in the corridor, you didn't really didn't have to leave your community. You could buy anything you needed, walk to the grocery store, a couple of drug stores, uh, places to eat. It was a chain of drug stores called the Cunningham Drug Store. And they had a um, fountain, what they call a fountain counter, where you could order lunch, food, something to drink. And we had one right in the community. So when I see the vacant lots, mm -hmm. I know that once there was a business there, that also extends to when I see empty lots next to houses, that it was, actually was no empty lots, none whatsoever in the community. So what the ghost is, 
when I ride by, I remember those things. I can see it, but it's not there. And the younger people can't see it at all. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have a vision of what could be because they never saw what was. So sometimes it's kind of sad when it takes you over and riding all the way from, I live at the Dearborn border, all the way towards Wayne State to see nothing but mm-hmm. vacant lots and then houses in disrepair. Because sometimes you look at the housing too and say, this is not what it looked like. It wasn't dilapidated. It wasn't people who didn't maintain their property. Uh, it wasn't piles of garbage. So those are the ghosts, the ghosts of past, or what it used to be like. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, when you were growing up in the neighborhood? Well, when we were growing up, uh, me and my husband often often say, he says this, he said it was so much fun that it really feels like it wasn't real. It, it was impossible mm. to feel that way and have freedom. As kids, you can run through the whole neighborhood. It was more safety. It's not that probably things didn't happen, but it was rare. Um You could go anywhere on your bike. You could just ride your bike forever. Um, like they're doing this Joe Lewis Greenway. We actually used to walk that rail corridor up to a bigger business district. It was like at Grand River and Oakland, where they had the major um, stores like Sears or Federal's was a big store like Sears here in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Montgomery Wards. These places had bigger, more shoe store, clothing stores that you would find downtown actually was in hubs within the communities. So growing up, it was just a lot of fun. It was, you could go anywhere. We had all kinds of activities. You had access to schools in the summertime would open up so the kids could come in and swim, uh, have activities to do. The city of Detroit had what they call the Parks and Recreation Department. Mm -hmm. It's a playground down the street from my house. Uh, The city calls them now parks, but we call them playgrounds. And each playground would have an attendant come out all summer, bring arts and crafts, bring sports. We got involved in sports. We played other playgrounds. And to this day, I can't remember how we got from one location to the other because it would not be the parents would not be involved. They didn't have to be involved. We just would go out in the daytime after you did your chores. You go out, you didn't come back. Some of us was talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember going to the bathroom. So we didn't (laughs) eat. We just played all day. You had to be home when the street lights came on. I mean, it was getting darker Mm -hmm. and you had to come. You should be home on the porch by that time. So it was just a lot of things to do. We had uh, I I learned how to swim because after school program, they had they had a bus to come and take you to the YMCA or even if some communities had the YWCA where you had access to sports and activities. So that's how I learned to swim when I was very young. Then they bring you back, drop you off at a point, and you walked home. You didn't have to have parents overseeing everything, you know, Mm -hmm. because it was safe. Now, a few years ago, that thought came to me that we were safe without even knowing that we had to think about safety. The adults created a safe environment and we would we didn't have to worry about looking over our back or is somebody gonna snatch my child or you gotta walk in pairs because we had to walk to school. Right. And some of them, depending on your school district, it could be a nice little walk. Even in the wintertime, it was fun because other kids were coming out. You eventually walked together to school. You walk, you met each other, you walked back home from school. So it just was seems like an I don't know if you watch um TV, some of these shows that was on in the 50s and 60s, even though they yep. mostly were white, they were white shows, but it still was reminiscent of even the Black community. Kind of uh, like the Wonder Years or the, the... Right. Yeah, like now Wonder Years, they put another spin on it now. Yeah, it's they did. Because yeah. Black people were going through things too, mm-hmm. and they were moving up. So yes, yep. it was it was that kind of um, environment. Mm-hmm. And uh, neighbors knew each other. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody was always watching you. And God forbid you did something wrong because somebody was going to tell. And Everybody you got it would both know. ways, <laughs> right? From the yeah. neighbor and your parents. Yeah. Um, 
schools were vibrant. I think I got a great public school, Detroit public school education. Mm -hmm. It was in the middle of the neighborhood. Like I said, you had community centers, you had schools, you had shopping. And a lot of times in the business corridor, that might be the first place that you got your job, you know, as a teenager, working at the corner store or the little grocer. We actually right. had a major market in the neighborhood. Uh, it's still a chain in some places, A&P. It was right here on Warren Avenue, right before you get to Livernois. But it was a small, it's a, that building is still there. It was actually a smaller AMP. The building was smaller, but it still was a major market. And it moved into a closer to Livernois, a new building. That's the one, that was our last market that burned down right before COVID. So it's okay. just, it was just, uh, also it was a component in there that the side north of Warren, was basically a black community when I was growing up. It was a few Polish families still here. But south of Warren was a large Polish community. But we all went to school together. Kids, it don't matter to kids. And um, we just grew up together. We learned different things from each other. And in that part of the community was a lot of um, bakeries that would mm -hmm. be like on the corner. A lot of bakeries, Polish bakeries. My uncle used to send us over to get his specific order of French bread cut a certain way. So we would walk over and we had to walk that way because we all went to the same middle school and high school together. So we it wasn't the picture of race issues you might see, have seen. It was during the civil rights movement but it wasn't the same that you felt as a kid. You didn't feel the same because kids don't look at it like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think mostly both of these communities, almost like the Wonder Years, economically mm -hmm. was the same because yep. most people all worked in the factory. Or if they didn't work in the big three, which those, was, those were good jobs back in the day that afforded right. people to buy homes. These, these were not renters. These was homeowners mostly. It's some small apartment buildings within the community, but mostly it was homeowners. So economically, things were the same. So to me, and it's just my thing, it's really never been about black and white. It's never been. And then when they say black and white, we exclude everything in between. It's so mm -hmm. much, the world is so much bigger than black and white. Yep. It's always been about green. It's about green, but people mislead us into pointing to differences in color, skin color. Other people make that the issue. Not so much the everyday working people, because if you got what you need, it don't seem to be a bigger problem. It's when people don't have, they look at another group and say, you the reason I don't have what I need. Um, Kind of piggyback on that. Um... In your opinion, what are some of the pressing issues in the neighborhood? Okay, the pressing issues to me is safety, mm -hmm. too much violence, education. We have no schools. Housing is an issue and right. jobs that can sustain you to be able to get a decent place to live, send your children to school, safety. And the last one might be transportation. Even though it's the Motor City, most people in Detroit, well, let me put it another way. People that live outside of Detroit have much more transportation. Um, we have a bigger transportation issue within the city of Detroit than those who live outside the city. They have access to cars, a better uh, transit system. It's always been an issue for years in the city of Detroit. Uh, I worked for the state of Michigan, and at one point, President uh, Clinton signed a, a bill or whatever to put in what they call uh, work first programs for um, family assistance. What happened is the whole framework of what you used to be able to get for those in poverty, like a safety net, it changed. And once that changed, people had to go to work. It was called work first. Mm -hmm. It was in 1997. One of the issues in the city was 
for customers, we call them clients or customers that receive public assistance, was transportation. Because most of the jobs was in the suburban areas. That's when I first realized how serious this is about people not wanting other people in their communities. The bus company here, the DOT here, and Mm -hmm. SMART, they only allow DOT to go so far out into the communities. The other communities did not allow the buses to connect. Well, how do people get to work if they can't get on get connected? They might work at say 14 mile and the bus stops at 10 mile or nine mile. Now you got to mm-hmm. try to get from there to the job. So it's it's still an issue with this transport uh regional transportation. They want a regional transportation system. But they get fought tooth and nail because communities do not want other people coming through their communities here in, in the Motor City. <laughs> um, going back to the aspect of safety and mobility, um, what are the, some of the safety issues that you have observed? Okay, it's a prevalence. You see it on the news all the time that people resolve issues with gunfire. And it's random acts of violence that can cripple people and terrify them. They don't want to go out at night because that's when most of this stuff happens. Um, so that's a big concern of their children. Like like the playground down the street, I have grandsons. And I, know, I heard one of them the other day, he 15, 16, asking his mother, could he go down? He liked to play basketball. And she says, first she says no, because it's out of her fear that something might happen at that playground and he get caught in it. Eventually she let him go, but she said, you gotta be back as, you know, if this happened, you gotta, so it's always this teaching a child. So remember when I talked about, I was safe without realizing I had to be safe because they never had to have that talk. Yep. But now you had to have that talk. So is it a real way that we could get back to a, place of safety with the reduction of violence because it is it's sometimes just everyday people i also um was curious where do you travel the most into the neighborhood and how do you get there are there any challenges you or in your opinion residents face regarding mobility oh definitely like people would like to be able to go like I see people walking, walking to the gas station, using the gas station as the market or somewhere to get something to eat. Prices is exaggerated and the food is probably something outdated. No fresh food and vegetables, maybe banana apples you see in there, but they also cost way too much money. So people are walking. I see people on bikes. I know they're trying to get to the market, to the not to the market. We do have one market left in the area on Wyoming and um, Wyoming and Joy Road. But their price is also exaggerated since they know they're the only game in town. So I pe- see people walking. Sometimes they walk on the greenway. Sometimes they riding a bike. So I know if they had access to a vehicle, they would go further to get what they need. So you really got to travel to try to get to a real market, I would say, versus a corner store or um, the gas station. Right. And and the street conditions and the transit systems to allow you to do that seamlessly, right? Right. Because the bus schedule is not right. always accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Then you don't, you, you're waiting, but nothing is coming. Yeah. 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 Um, So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, Ms. Long, uh, one of the reasons we invited you to the Framework Podcast is because of not only being an integral stakeholder in the community, but also your involvement with the Greenway Heritage Conservancy um, Mm -hmm. and uh, how it was a result of the work that is being done at the Joe Louis Greenway, especially, you know, the first phase, which is to the west of the Midwest Harmon Framework Boundary. Can you tell us more about the Greenway Heritage Conservancy and its goals and its mission statement? We started after being invited to to be part of the Citizens Advisory Council. 
and going to Atlanta, I could really see what this could turn into for our community. We have been fighting for years to get some kind of services, what, what we were asking for. Can you tear down the houses that cannot be rehabbed? Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a school, a community center? Uh, can you help with these auto places that's proliferating out of control? I think we had 34 in a 1.1 mile radius, uh, which was leaving debris all over the community, tires. Uh, we still see, we don't see as many tires, but you still see fenders. So when they, when I saw what it could do in Atlanta, I came back to those who were already working in the community and said, we need to uh, educate the people about this. This could be a way that we could get some of the things that we have been trying for the community, because if they're going to put this greenway here, they got to invest here or they should invest here. They don't have to do anything. They should invest here. So uh, LaMonda, who we call Red, LaMonda's idea was after we was going door to door, uh, we, we put on first, we put on two events uh, in different parts of the community. Hear the message about the Joe Louis Greenway, what it could be, and that to please engage in any of the meetings they have because it's impacting our community. We oh we also went specifically on Alpine and Green Lawn because we knew those families would be directly impacted with the Greenway coming through their backyard and try to get them to buy the empty lots next to their homes so they could control what kind of control what happens there. Also in Atlanta, some people got pushed out. I had talked to some people they got pushed out because the property value increased so much they couldn't pay the taxes. But um, they specifically gave me uh, one lady that it happened to, but I can't remember how much her property increased. Quite unreal, unreal. So anyway, we didn't want that to happen here. We didn't want to get have people pushed out. So that's when LaMonda came up with creating this community development um, nonprofit, the Greenway Heritage Conservancy. So in creating this Greenway Heritage Conservancy, our mission was basically to make sure that the community is safe, that people don't have, don't get pushed out because of development. Okay. Uh, one of the, the other reason for trying to secure the lots is that we found out some of the auto places were now buying the lots on the residential streets because they want to expand their business onto the residential street. We didn't want that to happen. So the Greenway Heritage is trying like to protect the current residents, make sure they can maintain, stay in their homes, get the resources they need in order to help keep those taxes current. Um, one of the other things we did as the Greenway Heritage, um, all the efforts of Joe Lewis Greenway process went to Zoom doing surveys, sitting in, and we knew the people on Alpine and Green Line. A lot of senior citizens didn't have access, didn't want access, don't want a computer. Mm -hmm. So she came up with an idea asking uh, the project manager, can we just bring the presentation out to the community? So they got approval. It was a really nice event. Police blocked the street off, used some of those vacant lots, did the presentation, and the residents could ask questions. They filled out their survey, you know, by hand. So they still had an opportunity to have input. And I think that changed their attitude uh, like a 360. Now, it is a few naysayers over there and probably everywhere, but they completely had a, something to hold on to. You know, you can tell somebody something, but if they never saw it, yeah, right, okay. But once we did that workshop and the people saw the construction start, it's right. like a whole different vibe on this block now. Right. Uh, some of the houses that people kind of fixing up and, and, and you know, I can hear that some of the, one of the ladies have grandkids. I see them sometime on the greenway. Uh, when other people come out, you see them out. They had a, a thing over there for 4th of July. They invited people over to see the fireworks because I guess the neighbors got together and, and bought fireworks together. They had 
all these goodies, totes with goodies, specific goodies in each one. I took my grandkids and my niece went and what they said, just bring your own chair. They had a center. It was just like a whole new thing happening over there. So um, I am curious to know, how do you envision the development of the Joe Louis Greenway impact the Midwest retirement neighborhood area? Okay, I think it's, 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 first of all, the ribbon cutting itself show what it can be. Mm -hmm. When people came together, positive energy, excited. It's a beautiful space. The before and after is almost something you can't imagine. Um, the part at the Warren Trailhead is going to be magnificent. When they, they put in a pavilion up, they got the play area for the kids, a place to have meetings, uh, a place to do family reunions or just the time to sit down and just enjoy the scenery. So if we could see what it did, just cleaning that out and how people feel now on both those streets, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be amazing. The task will be how to get people to use it. That's the next step, how to get people to use it, not just the people who live right behind it, but the whole Midwest. How do you get them to use it? Just like <clears throat> we didn't know until this Greenway that I think is Green Line and Rose Line. They also in District 6. We also, we always thought that was District 7, that that divided us. So how do we reach to get both sides engaged? Um, when they did the retirement, I mean, the Joe Louis Greenway planning study, I saw people from both sides of that so-called track greenway. That was good. That's what we're going to have to keep bridging with each other, creating these bridges. Um, the other thing, like the impact of the churches, how they can impact this. We got two longstanding churches, on one on either side of this track. Well, actually three, Central AME, Unity Baptist Church, and True Love. You have a member at True Love that wants to do, she's a nurse, do like marathons and healthy events on this greenway. Have a young lady, one of the officers at Unity Baptist Church talked about, maybe I could tell the women every Sunday, bring your walking shoes after church. We can start a walking club. You have another mm -hmm. person that was in the early on stages. I had to try to reach back out to her from Central AME who wanted to be the point person for her church, but then COVID came along. So I just see it as the catalyst for bringing on additional positive things within the community. So we had to find ways to communicate, to come on down to the Greenway. Uh, maybe create activities for them to come to the Greenway and see the possibilities of how to utilize it. The more utilization, the lower opportunity for crime. And sometimes that does concern, concern me. Was this a mistake uh, trying to get it here first? Was this, was this a good idea? Why do you um, say that? Because if we don't use it, it won't mean very much. You know, you got to get people out there. Now, it is people who use it already. And maybe once it comes up, because it also is supposed to intent is to connect neighborhoods. How can we connect to the next, next neighborhoods on each side of us? And it's got to be a reason for you to go there. It's got to be a reason, like we look at Warren. And then when I go to meetings, I say, okay, what 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 would make you think if you were standing there warning why I uh, warning living noise, what would make you believe that it's something down there of any value to you worth going down there? Because you got to fix up the entry. See, this to entrance way to me is the Midwest triangle. Mm -hmm. You you the entryway into the greenway. How do you make it look beautiful 
and a place people want to go down there and see what, what, what the real deal is down there. So we've been talking about mobility as kind of a thematic idea for this episode. And for the framework, we had this underlying motto saying, making connections with new opportunities. So from the okay. perspective of mobility as an element of the framework, do you see those connections like improved street that would actually lead to more opportunities? So for example, um, safer streets, closer proximity to a grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. That leads to an opportunity and it's very much intertwined, economic development intertwined with mobility. I was kind of curious whether you had a perspective on that, mainly due to the involvement with the Joe Louis Greenway. I think it will increase. Um, like I said, some people use it even to go to the market because it's an easier walk through or riding a bike through than trying to go down major streets or side streets. You have this open area that you can get from that grocer on Joy Road and Wyoming. You can ride a few blocks and now you're at the Greenway. So you can carry that back at least one mile back to mm -hmm. where you live. So I, I do some see some increase. Uh, I know at one time, I don't know why they didn't do it. They wanted to stop the retirement bus line. And we was like, okay, then it's too far for people to walk to another east-west bus route. So maybe the Greenway had an impact. Maybe it will have a bigger impact on timely bus schedule mm -hmm. uh, for people to get from point A to point B. So from the perspective of mobility, I don't think I've seen much so far, but we're not concluding, have, mm -hmm. have not concluded the process. So, but we'd like to see that. Like when they had the demonstration for the scooters with the Greenway coming, you'll see more scooters. You'll see more people being able to maneuver to where they want to go once we get a little closer to completing this first mile. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can get some of the things that people are asking for in the framework, I know uh, mobility will increase also for that. Say you tell us which door to go through to get the attention of developers. That all has an impact on possibly increasing a better mobility system. Because then you have people moving in that may have transportation or you have a neighbor that now they, they do, we used to call it jitney. Do you know what a jitney is? No. Okay. A jitney was a person that you didn't have a car. You went to a market. It was people sitting, standing around. They would take you back home with mm -hmm. your groceries. They call it, we call them a jitney. And jitneys would take people home so they could purchase what they needed to. But they had that as a mobility component mm -hmm. that they knew they could get back. They might be able to walk. They might take a bus to get to the market. But I'm going to have transportation to go back because it's a jitney there. Not legal. Probably was at one point. It's before Lyft and Uber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So having the ability to get back with your groceries or your product is important. So I see as we bring businesses back into the community, when we have a school or a community center, I believe that mo the ability to have better mo mobility will exist. If there's one thing you would like to see change in the neighborhood and be addressed in the framework, what would it be? Which one of these competing things would I like to see? I really would like to see Cheryl School turned into an innovation center slash education center like Durfee. We need a hub. A hub to give opportunity for education, business, and hope. See, when you have that, you get to see the world bigger. You get to see other people. You get a chance to sit down and have a conversation, talk about current events. They have all those things in Durfee as far as people being able to come and take part. And that changes lives. That reduces maybe the young person that don't have anything to do, get caught up hanging with the wrong crowd. Well, now you can hang up here at this innovation center and it's something to uh, 
give you a vision that your path could be different. A young lady was handing out flyers yesterday. I went to the African World Fair. Mm -hmm. They have a aerodynamic school, high school. Tuskegee Airmen runs it. But if you're sitting in a neighborhood and don't know anything about it, you don't know it exists. When they finish with these kids, because one of the people in the community is involved with them also, you have learned how to repair engines, aircraft. You even leave out with your pilot's license. Look the dynamic that one decision to go to a different high school, it takes you out into a world that you didn't even know existed. Now, how many people walk out with a pilot's license or any kind of license out of high school? But also, you know, the next step that you could get in aviation programs. That's taking somebody with little opportunity and handing them the world. Like the saying, so go for young people. The world is your oyster. But if you never saw an oyster, you don't know what's inside of it is a pearl. Right. You never know that. School not teaching these things anymore. When I came out, we had workable skills. Now you can't keep kids in high school because it's no longer relevant. Somebody sent me a text for my grandsons. Their son had went through a program for decoding. You know, mm -hmm. these kids know these systems back and forth, but nobody has them offering coding in school. They should be doing this in late elementary, early middle school, how to code. That's what their life is going to be. These systems, AI, which they probably would love it. They don't want to read about some dead presidents. They can't equate how that is working on my life. So you got this huge gap in education, the reality of what people are going through versus what you're teaching them that they feel like it's not important to my life. This education system of a derfy, the way they put it together, could definitely change lives. So that probably would be my first thing that I would like to see. It's not quite the uh, community center that we see in other communities, but it is um, a beginning. Okay. Um, we're coming close to kind of wrapping things up. Um, okay. So I really appreciate the time you're giving and the insight that you're giving to the Midwest retirement neighborhood and, and just your experience living in this city for such a long time. Is there anything specific about the neighborhood that you would like the audience to know? Something that doesn't get talked about that often? Um, residents, neighbors. We don't highlight the positive things in the community, mm -hmm. how they help each other, how they watch out for each other. We don't never talk about the good news. We just talked about the sad stories or crime in, in terms. Recently, somebody said they don't use the term. Uh, what's the term she said? She, how we talk about the people who maybe are not underserved, uh, underrepresented, and underprivileged. Right. So they're saying, that's not true. That's not who we are. We here, whether you give us any benefits or not, it don't make us a negative. Speak positive, use positive terms. And that's not, that does not get out. You could ride through the neighborhoods all through the city in May. You see all of these banners and big place cards in lawns that say, I have a graduate of so-and-so school. I have a graduate of this school. Nobody sees that. You just look at the dropout rate. You don't look at the drop who dropped in. And so the positive things about a community are not pushed forward. It's not continuous. But what if they fed us that all day? versus feeding us murder and mayhem. How would that affect our psyche? What if I didn't have to grow up on the street? If you go right three blocks over from me as Dearborn, ride down their streets, their residential streets, what do they see every day? And you take it for granted because it's just there. You ride down some of these streets, piled with garbage, houses broken into, vacant, 
what is that doing to the psyche of these children? And even right. we have a population moving in, I think they also have come from places that still look like this. But this is a new opportunity for them. But they still seeing one of the men mentioned it to one of the ladies over on the next block. He said, I left El Salvador. I thought I left this behind. The garbage, piles of stuff. I know I reported to the police. Some It's one four-unit family place. They leave their garbage cans out all week with no tops on them. What is that doing to their psyche? That they're not worthy. They're not worthy of what you see on TV. The commercial telling you, you can have all of this, this luxury house, this luxury car, every, the best clothes, the best cologne, but you're not giving them the pathway to that because you're still sitting here looking at devastation. So we don't get the positive messages that we need to be fed all the time. It brings hope. I had some pe very bad periods of grief. Mm -hmm. what helped me was I knew other people did too and I saw them visually that they got through it or they they reached back to help you don't see that you don't see that people reach out to help when they see people in need so those are the messaging that's important not just for our community but probably everywhere yeah and and I want to add something that I observed um we had the resource fair on June 23rd at the Ark of Deliverance. And as part of organizing that event, one of the things that I did was kind of make clusters of categories, housing, economic development, mobility, uh, parks and open spaces, and so on forth. And then there was the cluster for the block club. And you were still not there. Your table was empty, basically. And I think it was Dr. V, if I don't if I'm not misremembering, but she was saying, hey, uh, is that table taken or is it reserved for somebody? And I said, well, it's for Miss Log. And said, okay, well, um, we're just going to take it from her and we're going to fight if we need to. <laughs> she was obviously joking. But once you did come, the thing that I observe, and this is something I'd like the audience to know, is the tables were obviously clustered in one particular section. But what I loved seeing was the tables were being shared. All the block club members were just sharing each other's spaces. So certain things were kind of bleeding into other people's table, but it didn't matter because we're all here together. And that's one of the, the most memorable visuals I have of that day's event, just seeing you all pulling your resources together. And it's not something that you just say. Um, I sincerely believe that you preach through your actions mm -hmm. and this, how you uh, approach everything. So it was just lovely to see people like Sherry Burton, Ethlyn Carroll, uh, Dr. V, uh, Karen Walker, everyone just kind of like, hey, <laughs> this is our area. Let's use it together. Um, mm -hmm. So so I think it it very much resonates with how you see the neighborhood and and this aspect of just being there for each other and the sense of community that you do have, which some of my other colleagues who've come to the resource fair, they also made that same comment that you have a very lovely group of stakeholders in the community, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which is very encouraging for us as well to engage with you. So we talked about a lot of things and some of them were very personal and heartfelt. Some of them were the hopes and ambitions that you have for the neighborhood. Um, we did talk about mobility as well, but something that I've been doing since the beginning is um, end with this very last question. And the question is, if you had to describe Midwest Tireman as a song, what would it be? A song? Yeah. The first one popped in my mind is an old Motown song. Dancing mm -hmm. in the street. Dancing in Everybody's the street. coming together. They dancing in the street. They mm -hmm. having a good time. So I think that's Midwest for me. People don't see past the news, but it's really good people. And we dancing together. We dancing in the street. For Carlton having an idea years ago mm -hmm. on a building that didn't have but three walls and uh, uh, no roof and no floor that he wanted this to be a community space. And that's what it's turned into, another place for us to come and dance in the street, 
to Ethelin and Carolyn over there is doing something and it's still in Midwest that we're going to come together and whatever the function is, we're going to dance in the street together. We're going to dance with it. I think <laughs> it's Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. So that's the song I would see is upbeat. It's positive. We having a good time. Right. Yeah. I'm definitely going to listen to this uh, after we're done for today. Um, but um, Miss Long, thank you so much for your time and sharing your thoughts on the community in Detroit. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Well, on the internet, uh, we do have a Facebook account, Greenway Heritage Conservancy. And then we have Greenway Heritage Conservancy at gmail.com. And the phone number is 313-444-5198. And we have a post office box, 10487. Detroit, Michigan, 48210. Okay. Okay. Ms. Long, it's been a pleasure talking to you and getting to know you. This is Rashid Hassan Deepan signing off. Take care, Detroit. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please visit www.detroitmi.gov forward slash Midwest dash Tireman forward slash for the latest updates and episodes on the Midwest Tireman framework. You can also follow us on Instagram at Detroit underscore PDT.